Bruchem Aboyim. Thank you very much for coming again to this uh, new normal. Amazing, it's been quite a while now. Uh, I guess it really is normal. Anyways, um, thank you. To, welcome to our house. Hope everything is going well with everyone. We are in the middle of a uh, two-lecture series on A Tale of Two Women. Uh, we began last week. Again, this is the story of the relationship between Sarah, Aimeno, Sarah, the first of the mothers of Israel, and Hagar, her maidservant. Again, a quick um, review that uh, Sarah, Sarah was abducted into the uh, harem of uh, Paro. She was released after Paro was beset with many plagues. Uh, Paro then gave his daughter Hagar, a princess, to Sarah as a maidservant. And as we said last week, he said, better a, maid, better a maidservant in the house of Avram than a princess in my house. Um, the relationship was very good to start with. She saw her as a mentor, Hugger, and uh, but meanwhile things turned. She, when uh, Sarah gave Hugger to uh, Avram for a wife of sorts, she retained her status as a maidservant, but Sarah wanted a, a child. She was barren. And sure enough, uh, Sorga does bear a child, Yishmoel. And again, the relationship after, especially after uh, Sorga gives birth to Yitzchak, changes, but even before then. So again, the Torah very clearly says that Sara abused Hagar. Uh, there's questions about whether that was really her perception or reality, but let's get into the story and see how it unfolds. So again, A Tale of Two Women, second lecture. <clears throat> So Hagar cries out to God, and God listens. God tells her in Vayera 21.18 that I will make him, uh, Ishmael, into a great nation. Due to Sarah's oppression of Hagar, God has allowed Hagar's descendants to kill and oppress her descendants, Jews in the Jewish state, until this very day. The long hand of time. The mayor said in the Gemara and Yuma, 83a, that from a person's name, we can actually learn something about that person. We have a tradition that the name that parents give a child is really a form of prophecy. The name Yishmael can be broken up to two words, Yishomakel, that in the future God will hear. Now this is related to the expulsion of Hagar and Yishmael from Abravino's house. He sent them away with only some food and water. Yishmael happened to be ill at the time and so his mother had to carry him. Being sick, he quickly drank up all the water. She felt that there was really very little she could do to help him. And so she laid him down by a bush, walked off a distance, so she would not have to see him die. Now, Yishmael cried out to God for salvation, and God Almighty heard his prayers. Not hers, his, based on Sarah's feet. Now, from this story, we learn a great lesson. That the most powerful prayer that one can present before God Almighty comes from the person who is suffering himself. We also learn that the well that the angel shows Hagar so that she can save her son was there all the time. It was not miraculous. We also need to know that all that we need in life has already been prepared for us by a benevolent Father in heaven. We just need to open our eyes. Not just look, but have vision. The Ramban says that Sarah's harsh treatment of Hagar was a sin. He contends that this is that is the reason why the Arab nations, the children of Yishmael, have been allowed to persecute Jews, as I mentioned. The name Yishmael alludes to the fact that God would listen, future test, tense, not past. That in the future, God would listen to Hagar's pain and that Sarah's descendants would pay the price for her misdeed. I find it interesting that the name Hagar can be rearranged to spell the Hebrew word harag, which means to kill. An, allu an allusion to the fact that in the future, her descendants would be able to kill Jews so that we see now that we are in the fifth exile, the exile of Yishmael. It's also interesting that after Sarah dies, Avramavina remarries at the age of 140 years old and fathers another six more children. It states in the portion of Chayasar 24.1 that Avram took another wife and her name was Keturah. Rashi on the verse states, this really is Hagar. And she was called Keturah because her deeds were pleasant and as incense. 
It's interesting that these six sons that she bore for Abravina were sent away by him with gifts to the east. We never hear about the Orientals abusing or persecuting Jews in any way. They just burn incense, Katoros. All of this is based on the commentaries. But, you know, I find it difficult to understand logically how Sarah could tell Avram in the portion of Ayer 21.10, drive away this bondwoman and her son. The only reason why Sarah gave Hagar to Avram initially was for her to bear a child that would be, be his offspring. Sarah yearned for a child that she could raise and nurture as her own. You know, we're discussing Sarah, one of the greatest women <clears throat> that ever lived. In reality, she, she, Ishmael should have been a dream come true for Sarah. After all, she was the one who suggested that Avram take Hagar as a wife. One can only imagine the joy that Avram Bino felt having a son of his own. How could she not share in his ecstasy? She held Yishmael in her arms when he was just a little baby. She did all those things that mothers do. But most of all, how could she not love him? She lived with Yishmael for 13 years before she became pregnant with Yitzchak. How is it possible that she did not develop a loving, motherly relationship with him? So how are we to understand her insistence that Yishmael be driven from the house? Now, after Yitzhak is born, Sarah feels Yishmael is a negative influence on her son. And she tells Avram in 21.10, drive out the bondwoman and her son. This becomes one of the greatest tests that Avram Ravina would have to endure. She wanted him, the personification of, of the concept of kindness, the kindest man of all, to drive his own son, whom he loved, and her mother from his house. God says to him in verse 12, amazingly, Shema Bikolo, listen to her voice. Now the Torah says, Shema, listen. The, the Torah doesn't say, I say, do. It just says, I say. It says, Shema, listen. The word Shema means much more than listen. After all, when we say the, the prayer, the Shema Yisrael, God is telling us not just to listen, but more importantly, to comprehend. As it says in the opening line of the portion of Yisro, Vayishma Yisro, and Yisro heard. Everyone heard. But Yisro understood. He understood the deeper implication of all that God had orchestrated for the Jewish nation, so much so that he was compelled to travel into the wilderness to join the Jewish nation. Now we can understand God's statement, Shema Bakolo, listen to her voice really in a different way. One way is God is telling Avram, you don't think that there is a problem in your house? <laughs> listen to her voice. If you listen properly, you'll hear the pain that she's experiencing. There had always been people who contended that Yitzhak was not the son of Avram, an old man of 99 years. They said that when Sarah had been abducted into the harem of Abimelech, the king of the Philistines, it was he, a much younger man, who had impregnated her. So people were talking. Well, guess what? People are always talking. What difference does it make? Now we see with Leah, the Torah in Vayetze 29.17 states that she was Rako Sinayim, weak eyes. And on that, Rashi states, since she thought that her lot would fall to Esau, for everyone was saying that there are two sons to Rivka and two daughters to Lovan. The older daughter will marry the older son and the younger daughter will marry the younger son based in the Gemara and Baba Basra, 123. Still, why did she cry? We learn from the story of Rivka that you cannot marry a woman against her will. So what's, what's the problem? So the Kutzka says, from here we learn one cannot dismiss what people are saying. Sarah heard Yishma telling people that he was the only true son of Avram Avinu, his only legal heir. He said that Yitzchak was an illegitimate child. And Sarah felt that Hagar was the person who was putting these ideas in her son's mind, which is why she felt it was necessary to drive both of them, Hagar and Yishmael, from her house. Avram dismissed Sarah's feelings. God did not. So we learn from this story that a husband and wife need to talk, to communicate with each other. 
They should listen to each other's opinions so that they can reach a decision based on truth and on mutual respect. This is the only way that we can bring up our children properly. This is the only way that a wife can fulfill, fulfill her mission of being what's called an azer conegdo, a helpmate opposite him. <clears throat> we see that through her advice, both Yitzhak and Yishmael benefit. They both succeed in becoming servants of God Almighty. We see the same scenario with Yaakov and his wives. God tells Yaakov to leave Lovan's house. But before he does, Yaakov calls his wives out to the field. There, he discusses with them his thoughts about his relationship with their father, Lovan. He asks them their opinion about what they think about leaving. He asks them, huh, even though God had already told him that it was time for him to leave, it wasn't a question, but he made it one. With Yitzhak and Rivka, we see a totally different relationship. We do not see an open communication between them. In fact, when Rivka first sees Yitzhak, the verse says in Chayasur 2464, Vayipo me'al ha'gomo, and she fell off the camel. She took a totally recessive role in their relationship. And this is why Eliezer, the servant of Avram, was sent to find a bride for Yitzhak. He looked for a woman who would be able to indirectly help her husband proceed in the direction that would be most propitious. Someone who was resourceful, innovative, but not confrontational. We see that she never told Yitzhak what she had heard from the prophets about the twins in her womb when they told her that one would be righteous and the other would be evil. Nor did she advise Yitzhak to bless Yaakov instead of Esau. She orchestrated a scenario whereby Yaakov, not Esau, would receive the blessing. Resourceful. But at the same time, she stoked the flames of hatred between her two sons that would last until this very day. Again, the importance of communication between spouses. I think there is another way to explain these words that God told Avram. Shema B'kolo. Listen. Listen to the sadness in her voice. Rashi tells us on this verse that from this we learn that Abnavinu was inferior to Sarah in prophecy. She was a greater prophetess. Again, how could she not love Yishma? She brought him up from birth. I believe, you know, I actually believe she loved Yishmael deeply. She exiled him from her house for the benefit of Yitzchak, her son, but also for Yishmael's benefit. With her divine revelation, she was able to see that in order for Yishmael to reach his true potential, he would have to be exiled and then return. The same, the same was true of Hagar, whose attributes would be fragrant as incense, Keturah. Now the Ksavya Kabbalah states that Sarah being a prophetess was aware that at that moment Yishmael was not guilty of any major sins. Her concern was to expel him before he could cause irreparable spiritual damage to her son. This can be compared to the scenario the Torah records about the Ben Sora Mor, the rebellious son, who is condemned to be put to death before he can become truly evil. So the real problem was not with Yishmael, it was really with Hagar. There is a reason why Rabbeinu Gershon, Gershon instituted the edict of only marrying one wife at a time a thousand years ago. He forbade the practice of polygamy among Eastern European Jewry. We witness with the relationship between Sarah and Hagar, two women, who separately are considered to be righteous role models for all religious women, yet we do see tensions between them. There is a reason why a second wife is called a tsara, which comes from the Hebrew word tsar, meaning pain. Having two women in a house together can be a challenge, as we see with Yaakov and the relationship between Rachel and Leah, two sisters. Saras, in Yiddish, real problems and difficulties. So even though Sarah acted out of desire to do God's will, in many times, it, many, it many times becomes very difficult, if not impossible, to remove one's own desires and prejudices. In the end, we are all human. And though we may logically see something in a certain way, emotionally, it may be very difficult, if not impossible, to divorce ourselves from a situation and act completely without prejudice. Sarah's actions may have been initiated with righteous and godly intent, 
But in the end, the hurt and disappointment that she felt in a relationship with Hugger became personal. There were issues. In Sar, we learned that it is very difficult to see yourself objectively. In the portion of Ayera in 1812, she had been told by one of the three angels that had come to visit Avram after his circumcision, that she would give birth to a son. The verse states, Batitzdak Sarah Bekirbo. And Sarah laughed within herself. When God converses with Avram in verse 13, God asks him, Lama Tzachachach Sarah, why does Sarah laugh? Then we see in verse 15 that when she is asked by Avram about the laughter, she denies it completely. And she says, Lo Tzachachti, I didn't laugh. Now, how is it possible that a woman of Sarah's, Sarah's righteous status could lie? After all, in verse 13, it is God Almighty himself who testifies that she did laugh. So the answer can be found in the wording in verse 12, where it states that she laughed. But the key is Bekirba. The verse says Bekirba inside. The laughter she experienced never left her lips. It was only a thought, a dismissal of what she perceived as a ridiculous statement. A woman of her age being able to have a child. For a righteous woman of her stature, her reaction was deemed improper. What she should have answered was, Amen, with a hope and a prayer that the blessing would come true, rather than laugh. But still, she said nothing. Why was she so sternly criticized? You know, people communicate with more than just words. There is a universal way that people communicate. It's called body language. When we listen to someone speak and we roll our eyes, or we shrug our shoulders, turn our heads, or many other gestures, we may not be talking, but we are certainly communicating our feelings to others. Just like with the story of Sora laughing. She denied the statement because she didn't realize that her thoughts were so visible, but God did. So too with her relationship with Hugger. Sora may have thought that her issues with Hugger were private, and that she was hiding her pain and disappointment from the world. But in reality, the only person that, was not, that she was not being honest with was herself. That which she thought was a private thought was only too obvious and visible to Hugger, to the point where everything that Sarah did or said concerning Hugger was influenced by her deep feelings of fear and trepidation concerning their relationship and its influence on her household. We too need to learn from Sarah that thoughts need to be kept as thoughts. At the same time, we need to be honest with ourselves. Many of us have what is called a poker face. Everything that is on our mind is on our face. If that is the case, then there are times that we need to address not only our verbal responses, but also our facial and bodily responses. We display our happiness, sadness, worry, shock, and amazement, many times without uttering a word. Sarah may not have realized, but her body language may well have caused much more damage to their relationship than all the words that were spoken. We see somewhat the same scenario with Yaakov in his meeting with Esau. Yaakov introduced his whole family to Esau when they met. Everyone, that's everyone except for Dina, his daughter. He was concerned that Asa might look at her, find her attractive, and want to marry her. Yaakov felt that his brother was not worthy of such a diamond as Dina, so he locked her in a chest, certain that Asa would not see her. But he should have closed the lid with a heavy heart, sad that his brother would not merit to have Dina, a special woman, as his wife. Instead, he closed the lid tightly with just a little too much pleasure. He withheld his daughter from Asa only to have her raped later by Shechem. One can understand him putting his daughter in the chest to protect her, but it should have been done with sadness and tears. Rashi by Yishlach 32, 23 states, and for that he was punished, for he withheld her from his brother. Maybe she would have led him Asa back to the right path, and instead she fell into the hands of Shechem. God judges a righteous individual as we say, l'chut sarah, to a hair's breadth. However, in the end, it's amazing, all's well that ends well. 
Hagar and Yishmael are driven from Abraham's house as sinners. They return as Bali Tshuva, repentance. Hagar is sent away because of Yitzhak. And actually, it's Yitzhak himself who, after his mother's passing, brings Hagar back to Avram for a wife, as Rashi mentions in Chayasar 2462. Also, the numerical value of the Gemachi of the name Hagar is 208. The same numerical value as the name Yitzchak. Rashi also states in 25.1 that her name was changed. Why? Because her deeds were pleasant. So we see that she had grown. So much so that she merited a new name. A testimony that she was now worthy of being a wife to Abram Avinu. And though Dina is raped by Shechem, amazingly, even that turns out to have a positive ending. Dina gives birth to a baby girl who, according to the Medrash, is taken by the angel, the Malach Gavriel, to Egypt, where she is then adopted by Potiphar. All of this happened so that Yosef, the fourth father of the Jewish nation, would have a wife that would be worthy of bearing two sons, who would be the heads of the tribes of Israel, Ephraim and Manasseh. Even Yishmael repents and reconnects with his father Avram and his brother Yitzchak. The verse in Chayasara 25.9 states that Yitzchak and Yishmael together bury their father. And Rashi comments on this verse and says, From here we learn Yishmael repented. He did tshuva. We see he allowed Yitzchak, his younger brother, to precede him at the funeral. And that is the good old age which is stated regarding Avram. So once again, we see that nothing in the Torah, or for that matter in life, is an accident. As I always mention, God is the ultimate programmer. In the end, everything will be good. And if it's not good, then it's not the end. And with that, maybe look forward to the ultimate good, the coming of Mashiach Sekeno, quickly and in our time. Again, thank you very much for listening. Have a safe week, a healthy week. And God should bless you with only good. Shabbat Shalom.